How's everyone feeling? You know what I love about science? It's made the modern world what it is. Satellites, the internet, a device in your pocket that can take a picture, connect you to all human knowledge, and just maybe allow you to make a phone call. That's right. And all of these technologies began with basic, fundamental scientific research. And all basic scientific research begins with a question. A question like, how unique is our place in the universe? That led us to build a telescope and launch it into space. That's right. We needed science to know how to do that, right? And then we discovered thousands of planets orbiting distant stars. You know it. Science literally allows us to discover new worlds while simultaneously revolutionizing our own world. Our next group of speakers embodies that spirit, so please join me in welcoming each and every one of them, starting with the third ever Chief Technology Officer of the United States, Megan Smith. to be with all of you, my science people. It's a team sport that we play. Let me see your signs. Awesome. You know, it's people who do things, and we do science and technology. One of my things that I love to think about is history. And Churchill says, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you will see. And here in Washington, right next to the Washington Monument, I want to bring President Washington to us. Because in his very first State of the Union address in 1790 to Congress, he said, there is nothing which better deserves your patronage than the promotion of science and literature. <laughs> Knowledge in every country is the surest basis of public happiness. And so President Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin on the very first coin of the United States of America, what did they write? They wrote liberty, the parent of science and industry. So the legacy of America is science and technology and we are the inventors and we are the makers of these things together with our colleagues around the planet. So today we're back on the mall with a march. I brought my pink hat. But I also brought my pink lab glasses. And so what are we doing? My call to you is let's lift the hidden figures of all of the badass women, men, people of all ages. We've got our Mars Generation youth here. Do We've got our elders. We've got our indigenous teams. The Hokulea will be home to Hawaii. And so I want us to all know, let's fight cynicism. Let's lift each other up. And let's go solve the hardest problems in the world together. The universe doesn't separate the subjects. It's not like there's technical people and not technical people. It's just us. It's just us connected. So let's use that internet to work together, collaborate, and let's make sure that we get this government to lift up and support science technology funding and all of you to solve the things that we would solve together. Thank you. Go science. My name is Dr. Jessica Ware, and I'm here representing Rutgers University, Newark, and I'm a member of the Entomological Society of America. I'm an evolutionary biologist and an entomologist. Evolution, yeah, evolution. Evolutionary biology and entomology, which is a study of insects, are disciplines for everyone. I'm a single mom to two children. I'm a black female punk rocker with an LGBT family. My son and my identical twin are transgender, and I belong here. I belong in science. I'm part of a global community of entomologists and evolutionary biologists. The study of insects is by definition international, global, and collaborative. Insects don't see borders, and they can cross walls. 
The, Entomolog the Entomological Society of America is the largest insect science organization in the world, and we seek to improve the lives of the world's citizens by promoting biological diversity and developing safer food production. We're working to save pollinators while limiting pests and vectors of disease. We need to fund integrated pest management, which is an aspect of entomology that ensures food safety for humanity. Entomology is a vital science, and we seek to unravel past and current patterns of biodiversity and mediate threats to human health, like Zika, malaria, dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. Evolutionary biologists seek to understand which species are found where and why, and we need to continue to fund evolutionary study through the maintenance and growth of natural history collections and museums, through funding field expeditions to go out and describe new species before they go extinct. We must teach our children to understand evolution. We must teach them to appreciate and love insects and arachnids. They are, tr <laughs> they are truly fascinating forms of life. They are always interesting, sometimes ugly, sometimes beautiful, but never boring. Thank you. I'm Megan Duffy from the University of Michigan. 1.5 1 million people die from fungal infections each year, three times the number that die from breast cancer. At present, options for treating these infections are extremely limited. Surprisingly, by studying Daphnia, tiny shrimp-like creatures that live in lakes, my lab might have discovered new drugs to treat fungal infections in humans. My father is a retired New York City firefighter. When I talk about my research, he often asks, but how is this going to help people? My answer has tended to be, eh, probably won't, at least not directly. I was wrong. Daphnia might teach us how to fight fungal infections in people. I began studying Daphnia because they are key links in lake food webs. As we studied Daphnia and their parasites, we were surprised to find some chemicals that prevented fungal infections in Daphnia. We are now testing to see if they also work against fungi that cause devastating infections in humans. This is how basic research works. Working on a topic with seemingly no direct relevance to humans can lead to breakthroughs that have enormous unanticipated impacts. This isn't just a story about the value of basic research, though. It's also a story about the importance of diversity in science. My student who led this research is in a federally supported program that aims to train a more diverse pool of scientists. She is addressing questions that no one thought to ask before and getting incredibly exciting results. It's too early to know if my student's work will give us the next big drug to treat fungal infections in people but it is already abundantly clear that science is stronger because of her ideas and her research. To, par <laughs> to paraphrase Dr. Mark Schlissel, the president of the University of Michigan, talent is evenly distributed in society, but at present, opportunity is not. Science will progress further and faster if participation is broad, with people from all backgrounds able to contribute their ideas and talents to science. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Kellen, and I'm here representing public health. When I say public, you say health. Public health, public health. Woo! We all know that science is about data, but we need to remember that data tell stories. We all have a story. My story is that I'm a public health geek and a policy wonk. I'm also a queer transgender man. And science makes, helps make sure my community and I are counted and we count in decisions that affect our lives. Science is about all of us. It's my friend Amy, a bench scientist who's working to break new ground in the treatment of diabetes. Science is my mother, 
a citizen scientist who contributes the data from her backyard bird feeder, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And science is my fellow PhD students at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, Woo! who do research to inform policy decisions like the Affordable Care Act to ensure we all have the right to good health. But it's not enough to collect data. We need to share it. Advocacy is not a dirty word. Science is objective, but science is not neutral. The poet Dante wrote that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who remain neutral in times of moral crisis. We cannot pretend we are above the fray. Science is objective, but it's not neutral. As scientists, as human beings, our mandate is clear. It's for each of us to stand up for what we know to be true. And to stand together when working to shape a future in which we can all thrive. Thank you, public health. I'm Dorothy Jones Davis, and I'm the proud executive director of Nation of Makers. As humans, we are born curious. We are built to explore, to hack the world around us in an attempt to understand it. It is in our very DNA to try to use science to improve our lives, to help one another, to make each generation better than the one before it. From birth, a spark is born within us that calls us to be makers, doers, agents of change, and science, engineering, and art. They are the medium by which we make sense of this amazing world we live in. They are the medium by which we elicit this change. They allow us to observe, record, analyze, ideate, innovate, iterate, improve our world, and communicate the power of our creations. But without that medium, we are drained of our spark. So how do we set fire to our spark? How do we create a true nation of makers, doers, agents of change? We start by prioritizing funding for hands-on STEM experiences for our youth, by supporting the arts and creative thinking as a key component to inventing our futures and by prioritizing funding for research that will lead to the cures, the future technologies that will impact our world for years to come. And the cautionary tale is this, that if you do not prioritize these things, if you believe that the road to a prosperous future for America and the human race is paved without a foundation of science, technology, engineering, arts, and the math, you will, not, you will find yourself with no road at all. If humanity road runs out of its spark, if innovation is impossible, and if people are unable to conceive of solutions to sustain ourselves, our culture and our earth will be lost. There will be no road to the future. So let us stand today as members of the human race, a nation of scientists, innovators, and makers in solidarity to prioritize our future. Let us say yes to science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Yes to federal funding and innovation on this Earth Day. Yes to the Earth, and yes to a brighter future. Thank you. Go objective reality. I'm Sean Otto, author of The War on Science. Twelve score years ago, Thomas Jefferson crafted the Declaration of Independence to create a new form of government. Being a scientist, Jefferson turned for inspiration to Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, and John Locke, and he synthesized their thinking into a powerful but simple idea. If any one of us can discover the truth of something for him or herself, then no king, no pope, and no wealthy lord is more entitled to govern than we are ourselves. 
We're gathered here today to defend this fundamental principle, to tell our elected leaders that attacking science is attacking democracy. Denying science is denying democracy. And rejecting science is rejecting democracy. The greatest freedom and the greatest equality come not from the PR campaigns of wealthy corporations, nor from the demands of impassioned ideologues, but from public policies based on, emphasis, on, on evidence. So we say to our elected leaders, the war on science must end. The evidence shows that global warming is real, that vaccines do not cause autism, that research drives prosperity, that there are no such things as alternative facts, and that if you want America to succeed, Donald Trump, you can't lead it with your brain tied behind your back. We ask you to heed the words of George Washington that there is nothing, as Megan Smith said, which can better deserve your patronage than the promotion of science and literature. Knowledge is in every country the surest basis of public happiness. We march to challenge you to reclaim America's role as the world leader of evidence-based public policy and thereby rebend the mark of the moral universe back towards liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hello, science lovers. And a, and a special sego to all the members of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, observers of nature, water protectors, and defenders of Mother Earth. I'm Mary Jo Andrikan, professor of chemistry at Northeastern University, a Mohawk and a scientist. My research group and I work on interpreting the genome and on understanding how enzymes work. Jay. And where does this take us? To finding new ways to prevent and treat disease, to developing renewable energy systems, to designing new ways to make chemicals that are friendlier to the planet. We are also training our young people for the jobs of today and tomorrow. There is growing global demand for solutions in medical technology, clean energy, environmental protection, and biological and cyber threat detection. Innovations mean new industries and new jobs. The United States can and should be the world leader in these innovations, but this depends on investment today in scientific research and education, in the NSF and the NIH. To <laughs> To all the students of science, maybe, maybe it's discouraging to know that some of our national leaders today do not believe in what we as scientists are doing. But I promise you, we will prevail. The need for science innovation is critical. We will work to elect leaders who understand that scientific discovery is vital, vital to national security, health, job growth, and the planet. We, like my native ancestors, believe in science. And in science, the truth wins. Thank you. Bonjour, Anin, Sego. In the original languages of this country, I bring you greetings. And I carry with me this morning the voices of nearly 2,000 indigenous scientists, allies, scholars, elders from all over the globe who have signed the Indigenous Science Declaration. Let us remember that long before Western science came to these shores, there were indigenous scientists here, native astronomers, geneticists, botanists, engineers, and we are still here. 
Let us celebrate indigenous science that promotes the flourishing of both humans and the beings with whom we share the planet. Indigenous science provides not only a wealth of factual knowledge, but a powerful paradigm to understand the world and our relation to it. Embedded in cultures of respect, of reciprocity and reverence, Indigenous science couples knowledge to responsibility. Indigenous science supports society aligned with ecological principles, not against it. It is ancient and it is urgent. Western science is a powerful approach. It's not the only one. Let's march not just for science, but for sciences.